All right, everyone, welcome back. The next talk is called Nix as the Swiss Army Knife in Cloud Development Environments. Let's give Rafo a warm, welcoming round of applause. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for having me, um, Rafo. Uh, this talk is about using Nix in cloud development environments, and um, yeah, I'm gonna talk you through a bunch of, of those things. Um, as a day-to-day -day job, um, I work at GitHub, um, where I work mostly on um, the topic of continuous delivery of uh, the site and, and other tools, and um, I'm a contributor of Kubernetes and yeah, also work on Kubernetes at GitHub. Um, I'm mentioning this uh, as when we talk about cloud development environments, I'm gonna make um, examples that are related to myself and to my, my job. Uh, this means that I will be, all the examples will be based on uh, GitHub Code Spaces, which is a product uh, of GitHub to um, get uh, development environments in the cloud. Um, but all the examples I'm gonna do, they're gonna be relatively simple, and you can translate it to any other tool that you may, that you may wanna use. Um, so let's start this with a content warning. Um, you know, you heard in the previous talk about uh, Scene Eater. Uh, there's going to be a lot of sin in, in, in this talk. It's going to contain a disgusting amount of mutability. This is not the classic um, modern talk in which you'll make everything perfect and reproducible, immutable. Rather, a, a way um, you know, you know, to introduce um, uh, the use of Nix in environments where Nix is not present. Um, it can be good if you bought a ticket for this conference and you never used Nix before. Um, you you will be able to step out of this room and, and have done something with it, um, or at least have an idea how to do it. Um, and so, but I can also say that it's uh, kind of like 50%, uh, you know, how you, um, you know, meet some requirements and of a structure of an organization, right? So a very social thing. And 50% thank you to whoever maintained Nix packages. Um, so let's start with uh, an existential question that I ask myself a lot. Uh, am I still a developer? And, and why, why this question? Um, you know, if we think of a company and a structure of a company, uh, let's say you have four teams, A, B, C, and D, that maintain 10 pieces of software. Uh, one, two, three, four, to 10, right? Um, myself, in my role as a company, I tend to work not in a, in a specific team, not with anyone in particular, uh, I tend to make changes that are cross-organization. And that means that I have to go and touch a lot of code, ba code, um, code man, I'm gonna say code spaces, instead of code bases a lot. Um, <laughs> a lot of code bases um, in, in my day-to-day -day work. So uh, sometimes I work this way. Uh, this doesn't mean that to make a change, I need to go touch uh, you know, uh, several you know, code bases all the time, but simply that I'm, I find myself changing uh, topics a lot and, and projects a lot, and that requires that I have to touch a lot of those things. Uh, as you may imagine, I don't have all of them ready on my computer. I don't have all of them set up um, um, to, to develop, to contribute to a change. And a lot of time, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have them on my computer, first. And, and second, I also, um, you know, uh, also don't maybe have the time and willingness to build a perfect uh, dev environment for one of those projects because I may do one small pull request and I walk away and don't see this project uh, for another year. Um, all right, let's uh, step back a little bit and talk a little bit about things used to be like GitHub uh, a few years ago. So those were the instruction to get the GitHub monolith. GitHub is still uh, a big monolith written in Ruby on Rails, and then there are some tools and other systems around it. Um, that, those used to be the instructions. You clone GitHub GitHub, which is a pretty big repo, and then, um, then you run script bootstrap, script setup, and you're done, right? Looks easy on the instructions. Um, cloning the repo would take a lot of time. Um, so on a 50 megabit connection, which is what I had the first time I ran this, 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 um, th those instructions, uh, it was quite a lengthy operation, I can guarantee. And, and then you would do bootstrap and setup, and the whole thing was supposed to take between 45 and 60 minutes. So basically, you you start you you launch this in your terminal, and then you go get a coffee, and then another coffee, 
and then another coffee, and then you're all jittery, and you still don't have a server running. Um, and there was a problem. Um, it was a problem because people had to run this, um, you know, not often, but every new joiner had to run this. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't great. Um, the, the cost that you pay at the beginning is not necessarily the biggest. Um, the, the problem really is that it would leave your laptop all messed up because it would install a bunch of things. And now your laptop was uh, maybe the perfect uh, machine to develop this code base. Uh, but as soon as you were only um, from time to time working on that code base and working maybe other things inside the organization, it would be uh, you know, annoying to have a bunch of things running that you wouldn't fully control. Um, and I was doing, I, me, myself, I was doing a lot of uh, Docker things because, as I said, you know, the whole area of continuous delivery and, and Kubernetes is, you know, uh, maybe f has too much Docker in it. Um, and, and, you know, I found at, at the time, so GitHub is mostly a company that gives MacBooks to, to, to employees. Um, and that, those were the years of the Intel i9 Macs, which were those things that would just run way too hot all the time. Um, and, and so the experience wasn't really great. So after a while, I moved to uh, NixOS. Um, so I made my own NixOS and started cloning everything and making my perfect setup. And I just, it just it felt really good. Um, but then those were, this, this was still the time where I was touching just a couple of code bases, and that was it for me. Then I moved into this other role where I'm touching more things. And at the, the very same time together, uh, the, the company moved to um, introduce this uh, tool called Codespaces. Um, Codespaces is a product that allows you to get um, an environment um, in the cloud. So you, you basically given a repository or a branch of a repository, you can get a virtual machine with a container inside that contains uh, you know, a checkout of, uh, of a repository, and you can you know, develop in it and, 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 and you know, make changes. Um, the, the whole development of uh, the monolith happens in Codespaces, which has made the whole process of, uh, you, you know, the 60 minutes process into a uh, few seconds, um, because essentially there's a whole process of pre-builds that um, make uh, the environment ready for you. So you basically press a button and you have something that is already set up uh, perfectly. Um, and, but you can use Codespaces with, um, with any, um, essentially any project on GitHub or any project for us inside our organization. Uh, this is kind of like how my day looks like. Uh, you, I end up with a lot of code spaces for different projects. I had to remove the names of the projects, but you get the point. That's a lot of computers at the end of the day, and none of those are projects that I tend to maintain. So I go there, I have a project, and uh, it's something that I'm not used to. I don't know. It is configured in, in um, a specific way that the team uh, thought made sense for them, for the people that maintain it, right? Um, um, Codespaces is based on this idea of a dev container. Uh, the dev container JSON is a file that you can put where you say what you want this code space to contain. Uh, that means uh, extensions if you're using VS Code, uh, Docker-based image, um, and um, you know other binaries or tools that you want to have included uh, and that you may need, right? The thing is, uh, the team that owns that project maintains this description and maybe what they think uh, they, it's needed, and they may be right. Uh, for them, it's, it's fine. But me coming to this project once in a while, I, I may have other preferences and things that I like that uh, you know, I, I want to use. Um, so I think one setup per project is not going to fit everybody's preferences. We're all different, and we all like to do things in slightly different ways. Um, and the famous dream of a standardized development environment uh, inside an organization makes sort of sense, right? Because you, at the end of the day, you want people to be able to be productive in a quick way. But you also don't necessarily want to limit the possibility of customization. Um, random example from the internet. I don't know who this user is. This is from Battle Stations uh, subreddit. Uh, you know, this is a that doesn't look like my desk at all, uh, right? And it's just uh, it, someone took their time to develop their, their environment, the physical environment, right? And the same should be possible in, in, in a software uh, world in a cloud environment where you should be able to bring what you need to do your job at best. 
Um, so at this point, is the standardized development environment really a dream, right? It is for an organization, as I said, but uh, you know, as long as you're able uh, to bring what you need uh, to do your job at best. If you remember this, um, this picture that I showed you earlier, this is kind of like how, how I operate, and if you think that all of those software there are standardized in one way, uh, and I may have a different perception of what I need or the tools that I prefer, um, for example, like a lot of this development that happens, happens in uh, normally via VS Code. I may want to use Vim, uh, right? And maybe it's not there. I may find it extremely annoying. Um, so that's, that's simply a preference uh, and, and, and nothing else at the end of the day. But it may be extremely um, uh, important for me and for how I, I, I do my job. So I, at this, in this case, I needed to take all of those environments, right, uh, that um, maintained by other people that for me are kind of like those alien environments, and come there and have um, a Swiss Army knife, like a way to bring my customization with me um, and, and to apply them, um, you know, on the fly uh, so that I can do um, my job at best. So for me, that tool is Nix. Uh, and uh, mostly because of this, right? Uh, I don't know if those numbers are correct. I don't know if they're up to date. And I've heard, I've read a lot of controversy on, yeah, that's right, that's not right. It, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, this picture means uh, uh, Nix, uh, you know, with Nix, you get a lot of packages. That's, that's what I care about this, this picture, really. Um, and I think we can agree that that's the truth. Um, and in, those, in, in that context of uh, environments that are, not my environment, uh, it's someone else's computer. Um, I can, I happily use Nix uh, as a package manager, essentially, to add, um, you know, as many, um, as many things as I need uh, to do my job. Um, so uh, how does it work? Uh, and I'm gonna take a sip of water. Codespaces has this concept of, um, so when it starts, when you create a new Codespace, it's gonna, uh, clone your dot .files uh, repository. So you can configure a repository as your dot .files repository. Um, and when it starts after cloning that repo, it will search into that uh, repository for one of those files that you see in the slide. Um, and if one of those files is present, it's gonna uh, run it. Uh, in my case, I have a setup.sh file that contains some instructions. In my case, the instruction is install Nix. So every time I get to what essentially is someone else's computer set up in whatever way they thought made sense for the project. Um, whenever I create a code space for that project, um, when I run it, I'm gonna get Nix installed. And that means um, that opens up for me, like for a number of opportunities to configure and extend that environment on the fly as much as I want. And I guess you're getting where I'm going with the disgusting mutability. Um, so essentially my work is like this. I have a laptop, this laptop, um, and um, I have N code spaces. It can be 20, it can be one, it doesn't matter. Um, when they start the, the, for the first time, they run setup.sh uh, from the dot files, I install Nix, and then I use Nix to, uh, as a package manager to extend uh, that environment. Um, for me, it doesn't really matter uh, if how reproducible or not it is, which may be controversial in this room, uh, because as I said, I go there and those projects make one change uh, for a while and then possibly walk away and never come back on that project again. Um, and I just really need a way to quickly uh, get something up and running and, and do something else that is not, uh, what was the Debian repo uh, that I have to add, uh, which I, um, I don't necessarily know how to do. Um, to have a demo, it's a video because I don't trust uh, Wi-Fi is at uh, conferences, um, but I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna talk through it. Um, so, um, I hope this is gonna work, yes. Okay, cool, that's um, GitHub UI, um, that's a um, um, private repository called Nixcon, Nixcon in my organization, um, in my user, Rafo, um, and um, it's empty, it just has a readme. There's nothing, there is no dev container, there is no customization at all. Um, what, um, what I do here is um, um, I go click the green button, uh, I get a code space, I go do new with options because otherwise I get a super, super small code space which is mostly good for reading but I wanted something uh, slightly better because why not? Um, and um, I click the button and what this is doing is you know, start a, 
in this case, VS Code, uh, fetches up stuff. And you can see at the bottom, I know, I know it's maybe hard to read from the back, uh, but it's saying installing dot .files. And that step uh, is doing installing my dot .files. Uh, once that is done, this is slightly, obviously, slightly sped up. Uh, you get a code space. It's relatively quick. Um, and what I'm going to do here, um, I'm going to do, I'm writing kind, which is a program that is used in the, in the Kubernetes ecosystem to get a local Kubernetes cluster. It doesn't really matter. It could be anything. I, I did this because I know it's definitely not present. Um, and you can see it's saying, like, comma not found. So uh, kind is not available. Um, but um, if you see me here um, typing nix, you can see that nix is available. Again, this is zero customization, just through the dot .files, I'm getting Nix up and running. Imagine me going in someone else's project and be like, oh, I want to test this thing, and they didn't set up anything, which happens. Um, so what do I do now? Um, I can do Nix, and I can do a disgusting Nix m i and get kind installed. It's going to take a while, pull half of the internet, because why not? Um, and, and then I have kind up and running, right? So now I got a new code space. So you see the old one is still running. Um, um, I do the same dance. Um, and uh, I type kind, and I'm back where I started. So that, that's annoying. Um, it's annoying especially because um, for the way that I like to uh, develop in, in, this, in this scenario, right, which sometimes I have an environment that I don't know, a code base that I don't know. So I go there, I make a huge mess, and then at some point I don't know anymore what I'm doing, and I say, okay, I want to start from scratch, right? But I lost all of those changes, which can be kind of annoying. Sometimes it's useful to to get a fresh environment, right, and then start from scratch. And the good of developing in cloud isolated environment is that I can get a fresh one, as many as I want, right? I think there is a limit, actually, but uh, you know, it takes a while before you hit it. Um, and that's not a surprise. We're installing things manually. It's annoying. So still in my doc files, I developed like a relatively simple convention. I put in a file uh, in, in the repository, a file called, called space.nix. Um, and, and that file is as a surprising content, uh, and it's just like with import Nix packages, and then I get kind, right? Obviously, I can pin the version here. I've done it in some projects. Um, I can do a bunch of things, um, but, but this, this will get me where I want. Um, what I'm going to see here now is that I'm going to commit that file. Uh, I just want to struggle a little bit with Git to get the file and remember but that, that I used some aliases that I didn't want to use in this, in this video. But um, yeah, so I'm just going to get the, the, the file um, up uh, and pushed. And um, once that is done, um, I'm going to create a new one. So our code space, another environment, same project, same dance. Um, and, and what you're going to see is that um, it's just only the dot .files. And if I do kind, I have kind, right? That's pretty neat, but now you're going to be like, okay, you're cheating because you said you can't, you don't know those code bases, you can't modify them, but now you're going to go in there and you're putting a file in that repo. Well, some people may be fine with this, uh, with, you know, I'm bringing my convention, they don't care, it's a file they never heard of or package manager they never heard of. But uh, there is a more scalable approach that I'm also using. Um, what I mentioned at the beginning is that there is this uh, dot .files repo that gets cloned, and in that repository, uh, you can have whatever you want, it's your repository. Um, in that case, I, uh, I have this uh, simple convention where I have, um, um, you know, a folder called like the name of the organization, which in this case is Rafo because it's my own thing, but it could be GitHub or the name of your company. And then I put a file uh, that contains the name of the repository .nix, right? Um, in this case, I'm going to create a file called nixcon.nix, which is a lot of nix in, for, for, one, for one word, um, and put the very same content, right? Um, what um, this is going to do is um, essentially, you know, again, same content. Maybe you can skip forward a little bit as there is like a little bit of adding things. Now I create another code space. Um, important point: the code space on next file here is gone. So this this repo is back to the original state where there is only a readme. So create. Oh wow! Um, I think I messed this up. One second, we go back where we were. So we create um, an order code space, and, and you will see that um, if I go here, it's loading and doing whatever. Again, sped up quite a bit. It's only the files. 
And if I do kind, it's there. But the files are not there. So essentially, uh, what this is doing is um, using the fact that I have an external repository that's being cloned to this cloud machine to add um, an external to add um, other packages. Right? This is not a very reproducible setup, but um, uh, has been incredibly useful for me uh, in the day to work in my day to day work and going and modifying um, other people. What is essentially other people's projects when you can't bring a ton and um, that's what powers this. Standline of Bash is disgusting, but it works. And um, there are probably better alternatives, like Excel, Flakes, DevM, and a bunch of other tools that you may be hearing about today and tomorrow and in the other days. Um, but um, that's what uh, took me quite forward. Um, and I've been using this for a while before Flakes were a thing and, and so on. Um, all right, so uh, takeaways. Uh, well, first of all, Nix is a great package manager. It has a lot to offer, um, and you can use it to um, you know, install whatever you want and customize your, your environment as, as needed. Um, and the second for me is really start wherever you want. Uh, I know that a lot of, uh, th there is a lot of that, that have been said in the uh, Nix community about uh, Nix being some, somewhat intimidating, and there is a steep learning curve and all those things. Uh, but you're not forced to do the perfect setup all the time. You're not forced to use anything uh, at, at the full extent and maximum modern way. You can start with, uh, with a simple approach, even, even if this simple approach is I just install things manually and thing, until things work, if that is right for you. Um, and I have tried other approaches, obviously, but I wanted to really keep uh, like this, this simple approach as an example of something that can get you started. Um, and the third is you should be free to customize your computer, and that I think uh, that's also very important. Like uh, it, there is no one way, one right way to do things. There is no one right editor. There is um, nothing that, that should make you feel forced to uh, keep one way of doing things if that is not the right way uh, for you. And I think that was it. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. All right, questions. Uh, has anyone at GitHub other than you started using that after seeing the magic? Um, <laughs> good question. Um, not really. Uh, I think um, um, so. The, um, we have different types of usages of code spaces. I think that for GitHub, GitHub the monolith, that is extremely developed. Like you get really, really a lot, and and it's a very complex use case. You really don't want to mess up with this that much. For other code, for other environments, um, I don't think we have. Um, I, I think we have some people that have, that have uh, tried this um, using Nix, but we haven't have um, you know uh, widespread uh, usage. Uh, I definitely made internal demos about this, so some people are aware that that it exists or what are the possibilities there are to expand also um, you know parts of the toolings that we have. Um, but um, I personally haven't been involved in a lot of the, you know, I haven't been evangelizing this uh, too much, if I have to say. So um, I created my own code space a couple of years ago um, from a container, but it's, it's been a while, so I, f I forget uh, exactly how it works. But how, how simple or unsimple would it be for, for teams to use code spaces with Nix on their own? So, so let's say that I have like, um, I am, uh, well, let's assume that 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 specific people aren't applying their own like you know dot file overlay, but just rather that there's a standardized thing, um, you know, potentially as an as an alternative to Duren plus Flake or something like that. It is. I, I think it's pretty simple. Uh, you can you can think that you can customize the base Docker image that is used for the for the code space. So if you replace what you get by default with um, like what I've seen a lot of teams doing is like there is a base image for Go and a base image for Ruby and they just want to have the right Ruby version, the Go version, and that's it, right? So where the kind of like most of the people limit themselves to, uh, but you could say like my base image contains Nix, um, and and you know you can then you can put whatever you want. The format is not particularly complicated. It's really uh, so the dev container JSON is you can do pretty much whatever you want. Um, I myself. Uh, fun, uh, sometimes a little bit limited by 
uh, the fact that some teams tend to customize that a lot, and then you know I can't come in with my customization, you know, my overlay, so to say. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that uh, if you have a group of people that may, for example, standardize on Nix, like they may agree on, hey, we have Nix everywhere, or we all new use Nix, you could make this uh, like really, really simple uh, to use, right? Um, yeah. All right. Thank Let's you. Let's give our speaker another round of applause.